The Königsberg class of cruisers was, in a sense, the first modern cruisers to be commissioned into the German Navy or Riches Marine dirt after the end of World War I and the scuttling of the, high, of the German high seas fleet at Scapa Flow. The Konigsberg class of uh, light cruisers were built under the limitations of the Washington Naval Treaty. For a slightly better understanding of what the limitations entailed, I'm going to pass it over to a clip from an important histories video on the KMS Konigsberg. On April 16, 1919, the German Admiralty was instructed to create the provisional Reichsmarine, and only several months later, the scuttling of the high seas fleet took place. Subsequently, any new German warship had to replace a ship condemned to scrap from a list of the most modern remaining after the scuttling. The German Navy was cut down drastically in fulfilling the Peace Treaty of Versailles. The Navy was restricted to a standing force of 15,000 men who crewed obsolete pre-dreadnoughts, and critical to our story, the Reichsmarine was allowed to have six light cruisers. These light cruisers were not to displace more than 6,000 tons, and the armament was not to exceed 15 centimeters or 5.9 inches. Commonly known as the K-Class, the Koenigsberg, alongside her two sisters, the Karlscher and the Kohlen, were built during the late 1920s and the early 1930s. Having to follow the Washington Naval Treaty, the ships of the Koenigsberg class were 554 feet long at the waterline and 571 feet long overall. They had a beam of 50 feet and a maximum draft of 20.6 feet. With a designed displacement of 6,640 long tons and a standard displacement as defined by the Washington Naval Treaty of 6,000 tons or 6,000 long tons. They displaced um, 700 or 7,700 long tons at full load. The ship's hulls were constructed from long longitudinal steel frames and incorporated extensive welding to save weight. Up to 85% of the hulls were welded rather than riveted. The hull was divided into 19 watertight compartments and had a double bottom that extended for 72% of the length of the hull. But this hull design would prove to be complicated and extremely unreliable with cracks and warps in the compartments appearing very often throughout the cruiser's short careers. The Koenigsberg class cruisers had a standard crew of 21 officers and 493 less than men. This later increased to 23 officers and 558 to 591 enlisted men. And during World War II, the crew, the crew size rose to between 820 to 850 officers and men. The ships carried a number of smaller vessels, including two picket boats, two barges, two launches, one cutter, and one dinghy. The ships were um, moderately good sea boats, but they had the, the potential to capsize if internal stores were improperly loaded, and suffered from a slightly helm. They healed up to 20 degrees with the rudder hard over. They were nevertheless very maneuverable and lost a little speed in a, in a head sea in a hard turn. They lost up to 20% speed. In the 1930s, all three members of the class were modified to carry a pair of float planes for reconnaissance. They were equipped with an aircraft catapult to launch the planes and cranes to recover them after they landed in the water. The ships initially carried two Henneke um, HE-60 biplane float planes, replaced later in the decade with two R um, Arado AR-196s uh, mono float planes. 
only one aircraft could be stored on the catapult at a time. The second air, the second plane had to be dismantled and replaced and placed in storage, and the ships did not have a hangar to store it in. Their propulsion system consisted of four steam turbines and a pair of 10-net cylinder four-stroke diesel engines. The turbines were split into three engine rooms, with the diesels in their own rooms the directly aft of the turbines. Steam for the turbines were provided by six Marin-type double-ended oil-fired water tube boilers. The engines powered a pair of three bladed screws that were 4.1 meters or 13 feet wide on the first two ships and 3.7 meters or 12 feet in diameter on the colon. The ship's propulsion system provided a top speed of 32 knots and were rated at 65,000 shaft horsepower. Though all three ships exceeded 68,000 ship horsepower on speed trials, the ships carried 600 tons of fuel oil as designed, but could store up to 1,350 tons. This gave them a range of approximately 5,700 nautical miles at 19 knots and 7,300 nautical miles at 17 knots. Steering was controlled by a single rudder. The ships had three turbo generators and two diesel generators for electricity. The generators had a combined output of 540 kilowatts at 220 volts. Moving on to the armaments, the ships were armed with nine 15 centimeter SK C-25 guns mounted in three triple gun turrets. One turret was located forward, and two were placed in the super firing pair aft. The rear gun turrets were offset to increase their arc of fire. They were supplied with 1,080 rounds of ammunition and 120 shells per gun. As built, the ships were also equipped with two 8.8 centimeter SK L45 anti aircraft guns in single mounts. They had 400 rounds of ammunition each. The Konigsberg class also carried four triple torpedo tube mounts located in midships. They were supplied with 24 50 centimeter. 20 inch or 20 inch torpedoes, though they were replaced with 53.3 centimeter or 21 inch models by 1940. The ships were also capable of carrying 120 naval mines. Midship frame with, with um, position of armor, the ship's anti aircraft batteries were revised and improved throughout the course of their careers. The original single-mounted 8.8cm guns were replaced with twin mounts for the new 8.8cm SKC-32 guns, and a third twin mount was also installed, bringing the number of guns to six. Eight, um, 3.7cm or SKC-30 Guns were installed in the mid 1930s, and up to eight to two centimeter flak 30 guns were also added. Colon, the only ship to survive the end of the war, was ultimately armed with eight 3.7 centimeter and 18 2 centimeter guns, though provisions had been made to mount up to 10 and 24 guns of the two calibers, respectively. Now, time to talk about the one thing that makes these ships earn the designation of fragile, the armor. The ships were protected by an armored deck that was 40 millimeters or 1.6 inches thick amidships and tapered down to 20 millimeters 
or 0 0.79 inches on either end. They had an armored belt that was 50 centimeter or 50 millimeters or 2 inches thick and capped it with 70 millimeters or 2.8 inch thick bulkheads on either end of the belt. Underwater protection consisted of, fifth of a 15 millimeter or 0.59 inch torpedo bulkhead and a 20 millimeter collision bulkhead. The conning tower had 100 millimeters or 3.9 inch, inch sides and a 30 millimeter or 1.2 inch roof. The ship's gun turrets had 30 millimeter faces and 20 millimeter roofs, sides, and rears. The barbettes for the turrets were also 30 millimeters thick. Carlshire was later fitted with increased armor protection, consisting of 10 to 14 millimeters or 0 0.39 to um, 0 0.55 um, inch outer plating that consisted of the of the new Walton Wench steel and an upper deck that was 16 millimeters or 0 0.63 inches. So, these ships have a really, really close history due to the fact that they were all involved in the invasion of Norway. But where we differ is that two of these ships would not make it out of Norway or the invasion of Norway. One ship would, so and so instead of going through the um entire um or going through the history of the Konigsbergs or as a whole, um I, I wanted so I have decided so I'm going to do these separately. To make sure that these are understood in, in a way that we could actually see the difference. Because, because each of these three cruisers played a significant role in their own part. And I, I don't think it will be justice enough that I do the entire class as a whole. But um, that I do each ship differently. So um, with that being said... Um, um, we will be taking a look at all of them separately. Uh, so, we will be starting with the leader of the class, the KMS Konigsberg, and then going down the line, and then going, um, through the other two ships, at, um, um, based on time of commissioning. So, um, with that being said, um, I truly do hope that you guys will enjoy this section, um, and that you guys will be able to learn in depth about each and every one of these, um, cruisers, so with that, um, enjoy. Konigsberg was ordered as Cruiser B, and given the temporary name, um, as set Yes, since she was intended to replace the old cruiser, um, Theatus. She was laid down at the Reaches Marnwarf in Wilmshaven on the 12th of April, 1926, and launched on the 26th of March, 1927. She was commissioned into the Reach Marine on the 17th of April, 1929. After her commissioning, the ship was assigned to the as the flagship of the reconnaissance force for the German fleet. She thereafter conducted a series of training cruises for naval cadets and made numerous goodwill visits throughout the Mediterranean Sea. In 1931, the ship's first major modification took place. Her foremast was shortened and her rear superstructure was slightly lengthened. Otto von Sch um, Schirrer commanded the ship from the September of 1931 to the September of 1934. Her um hubbet um shipment relayed or relieved him and served at the ship's as the ship's captain for the following year, 
1934, a pair of 8.8 centimeter or 3.5 inch anti-aircraft guns and individual mounts were installed on her aft superstructure just forward of her main battery turrets. That same year, she and the cruiser Leipzig, or Leipzig made the first at goodwill visit to the United Kingdom since the end of World War I, 16 years earlier. In 1935, the ship had an anti-aircraft or an aircraft at catapult installed along with a crane to handle float planes. The following year, the single 8.8 centimeter guns were replaced with a new um tri um tri uh, tri stabilized twin mount. Two other twin mounts were added in the, on the rear superstructure. Fire control directors for the anti aircraft guns were also added. After emerging from this refit, Konigsberg was employed as a gunnery training ship during the Spanish Civil War in the late 1930s. The ship participated in non-intervention patrols during which she forced the Republicans to surrender a German freighter that had been seized. After returning to Germany, Konigsberg resumed her gunnery training duties and also served as a testbed for radar prototypes. She was scheduled to be transferred to the U-boat school where she would be used as a target ship for U-boat crews. This duty was interrupted by the outbreak of World War II in September of 1939. One day before the German invasion of Poland on the 31st of August, Koenig spotted the Polish ashore Berza and um, Boski, um, Baskwa in the Baltic. At the, at the start of hostilities, she and several other German cruisers laid a defensive minefield in the North Sea. She was then she then went into the Baltic Sea for training maneuvers. Kurt Caesar Hoffman or Hoffman served as a ship's captain from June to September of nineteen thirty nine. In late nineteen thirty nine, a um, distinguishing coal or coil was installed on the ship's hull. Konigsberg returned to active duty in March of nineteen forty when she was assigned to the invasion force for the attack of, on Norway. The invasion of Norway took place in early, in early April of 1940. Konigsberg was assigned to Group B-3 and was tasked with transporting 600 troops from the um, Wurtzmanth um, 69th Infantry Division from Wilhelmshaven to Bergen, Norway. Group E-3 also included her sister ship, Colon, the artillery training ship, Bremsey, and the torpedo boats, Wolf and Leopard. The Germans left Wilmenshaven on, on the 8th of April and had reached their targets the following day. After Konigsberg transferred part of the landing party to several smaller vessels, she then made a high-speed run into the port in an attempt to land the remainder of the infantry in the town directly. A 21-centimeter or 8.3-inch coastal battery at the Kornvind Fort took the ship under fire and scored three hits, all forward. The hits caused severe flooding and the fires in her boiler rooms that cut the ship's power. Adrift and unable to recover, Konigsberg had to drop anchor while she and Colin woof off the bombers and the infantry neutralized the, the Norwegian guns. Konigsberg required major repairs before she would be able to return to Germany, so she was temporarily mourned in the harbor with her broadside facing the harbor entrance. This would al alone uh, or allow her to bring all her main battery guns to bear against any British naval attack. The rest of the Group B, the rest of Group B three, returned to Germany on the evening of the ninth of April. She was attacked by British bombers, but to no effect. The following morning, the British launched another raid on the ship. The raid consisted of sixteen ba um, Blackburn Skua dive bombers of the British fleet arm.
air arm, seven of eight hundred, seven of eight hundred naval air squadron, and nine of eight of the eight hundred and three naval air squadron, launched from the RNAS, um, Hidston, Orkney. Konigsberg's thin deck armor rendered her quite vulnerable to dive bomber attack. The Skuas attacked in three groups. The nine of the three hundred of the eight hundred third NSA, six of the eight hundred NSA, and one aircraft of the eight hundred NSA, which lost contact during the outward flight, but found Konigsberg independently. The dive bombers attacked at at uh, seven twenty, catching the ship's set crew off guard. Half of the dive bombers had completed their dives before the crew realized they were under attack. Only one large anti-aircraft gun was reported as being manned with shells being fired once every five seconds from the aft of the ship with lighter anti-air weapons firing from the shore and adjacent ships firing even later on the in the attack. Konigsberg was hit by at least five 500 pound or 230 kilogram bombs, which caused serious damage to the ship. One penetrated her thin deck armor, went through the ship, and exploded in the water, causing significant structural damage. Another hit destroyed the auxiliary boil room. Two more bombs exploded in the water next to the ship. The concussion from the blasts tore large holes in the hull. She took on a heavy list almost immediately, and the captain ordered the crew to abandon the ship. It took slightly less than three hours from the start of the attack for the ship to completely capsize and sink, which gave the crew enough time to evacuate many of the dead and wounded. They also had time to remove a significant amount of ammunition and equipment from the stricken cruiser. Only 18 men were killed in the attack. The wreck was raised on the 17th of July, 1943, and towed to Hergenst. It was later towed to um, Leskvix on the south side of Bergen Harbor and rightened. However, the whole kit could only be kept afloat by consistent pumping, and was therefore put into the floating dock at Leskvig. Unfortunately, the wreck fell over when the dock was raised, causing considerable damage to the dock, and leaving it uh, with a 11 to 13 degree list. The hull, however, sealed. Uh, the hull was, however, sealed and refloated, and remained at um, Luskvig until February of 1945, when it was towed to um, Hardon Forgend and allowed to settle with a heavy list. At um, Bergen, at Berland Schudent, to the east of Askoy, the ship would, would um, the ship would be salvaged once again on the 14th and 15th of September of 1945 and to Stalvinger, linking throughout, and scrapping would be completed there by 1947. Ordered as Sent Cruiser C, and given the temporary name of Erstest Medusa as a replacement for the old cruiser Medusa. Construction of the Carlsher began on the 27th of July, 1926, with her keel laying uh, at the Dutch Worky shipyard in Kiel. She was launched on the 20th of August, 1926. 1927, and was commissioned into the Richer Marina, or the Reichsmarina, on the 6th of November, 1929. Carl completed a completed sea trials in the Baltic Sea after entering service, after which, after which she was assigned to training ship duty.
In May of 1930, she departed on her first overseas training cruise to Africa and South America. After returning to Germany, she was modernized late in the year. Her foremast was shortened, and her rear superstructure was slightly enlarged. After the next five years, she embarked on four more world cruises for naval cadets, traveling as far as Japan. Between each cruise, she conducted exercises with the rest of the fleet in German waters. Gunther Wuchens served as the ship's commanding officer from September of 1934 to, septem to the September of 1935. In 1935, she had more modifications made, including the installation of a pole mast aft of the funnels, along with an aircraft catapult amidships with a crane to handle the float planes. On her last training cruise in 1936, Carl Scher was badly damaged by a tropical storm in the Pacific Ocean. Structural weaknesses in her mostly welded hull play plating caused significant damage, and the cruiser was forced to put into San Diego in April for repairs. There, her hull was repaired and strengthened, which increased her displacement and beam slightly. She returned to Germany in June of 1936 and immediately went to dry dock for more permanent repairs and a major overhaul. During this period in dry dock uh, hands, she had her two single uh, mount 8.8 centimeter anti aircraft guns replaced with three twin mounts. Fire control directors were also installed for these guns. After emerging, after emerging from this refit, she conducted the sea trials and then joined the non-intervention patrols during the Spanish Civil War, though she only remained off Spain for a few months. After returning to Germany, she resumed training duties in the Baltic. She was withdrawn from service in May of 1938 for a major modernization. The funnels were modernized with raked caps and searchlight platforms on their sides. The ship's 8.8 centimeter anti-aircraft guns were replaced with more powerful 10.5 centimeter guns. Work lasted until the November 1939, shortly after the outbreak of World War II. She spent the next several months on trials and training maneuvers. And the 4th of January, Carl Scher and the Mindware um, Schiff 23 were sent, to in, were sent to intercept the Swedish steamer Kongen Oscar, which was transporting Polish refugees from Riga to Sweden. Carl Scher caught the Swedish vessel and declared it a prize and sent it and the 41 Poles aboard to Memo. She was not ready for combat operations by the start of Operation Wessenbrug, so she was used as a troop transport for the attack on um, Christiansund. The attack force also included an, an E-boat tender, four large torpedo boats, and several E-boats. The evasion force departed Bermanhaven early on the 8th of April, 1940, with Captain or um, Captain Zer um, C. Frederick Riva aboard Carl Scher commanding. When it arrived at um, Christensen, heavy fog covered the area, making the passage of the forge outside of the harbor very hazardous. As a result, the German ships had to wait until morning of uh, the 9th of April to attack to begin the attack. As Carl Scher entered the forger, she came under heavy fire from the Norwegian coastal guns uh, to um, Arbert Fortress. The cruiser turned in the forger to bring her full broadside into action. The artillery duel lasted for about two hours before heavy fog again covered the port, face forcing both sides to cease fire. The Norwegians sur sur surrendered an hour later, and the German ships landed their embarked troops. 
Carlsher, then Lieutenant Kitchenson, on the evening of the 9th of April, with three of the torpedo boats as escorts. The British submarine, HMS Trant, was positioned outside the four-door, and when her crew spotted the German ships, she fired a spread of torpedoes. Carl Scher took evasive action, but one torpedo struck her on the starboard side, amidships, blasting a large hole in the hull and allowing thousands of tons of water to flood in. The flooding disabled her engines and electronical generators, which cut off power to the pumps that were trying to keep pace with the incoming water. With those pumps um, inoperable, Revy decided that there was no hope of saving Carlisher and issued the order to abandon ship two hours after the attack. The torpedo boat Grief took off her crew and fired two more torpedoes into Carlisher to scuttle her. Reeve and his executive officer were severely criticized in an investigation into the sinking for failing to take all possible steps to save Carlsher. The report concluded that since the ship was still afloat after two hours and two additional torpedoes were required to sink her, it might have been possible to take her under tow back to um, Christensen or another port. In addition, the forward pumps still had power, and so the flooding could have been slowed enough to permit a return to a safe harbor. Carlsher would sink, um, would have, um, would sink in deep water, and the exact position of the wreck remained unknown for more than 80 years. The Norwegian power grind operator, um, Stanton, conducted a sonar survey in April of 19 in April of 2017, that located the wreck, but did not identify it at the time. The vessel lies upright on the sea floor, 15 meters, or 90, 90, or 49 feet, from the submerged power line between Denmark and Norway. Operated by um, Stanton, Carl Schur's bow is no longer attached to the vessel. The wreck is some 13 nautical miles off the Norwegian coast, at a depth of about 490 meters, or 1,610 feet. Stanton sent another expedition on the 30th of June, 2020, with the survey vessel Olympic Taurus to conduct an investigation of the wreck using remotely operated underwater vehicles after a severe storm, to confirm that the cable had not been damaged. The company confirmed in September that it was, indeed, the Carlsher. Colon was ordered as Cruiser D under the contract name um, Institut um, Arnon Cudd as a replacement for the old cruiser um, Arcona. The curl for Colon was laid on the 7th of August 1926 at the um, Reach Marine Wharf shipyard in Wilmenshaven. She was launched on the 23rd of May, 1928, and commissioned into the Richmond Marina on the 15th of January, 1930, the last member of her class to be completed. She spent the year conducting sea trials and training in the Baltic Sea. In 1939, she was modified with dual 8.8cm anti-aircraft guns to replace the original single mounts. The rear superstructure was enlarged, and a fire control system was installed aft. Colin departed on a cruise into the Atlantic in early 1932 for more extensive sea trials. After returning to Germany, she took on her first crew of naval cadets for a world cruise, departing Germany in late 1932. The tour lasted a full year. She stopped in ports across the globe, including in the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans, and the Mediterranean Seas, or Mediterranean Sea, and Australia, 
the tour stops included Alton, Melbourne, Mer- uh, Sydney, and um, Hobart, with the crew taking place in several publication, um, public, public um, sized football games against local teams that included a Royal Australian Navy team in Sydney. In 1935, the ship had an anti-aircraft or an aircraft catapult installed along with cranes to handle the float planes. A pole mast was also um, installed on the rear side of the aft funnel. Colon continued to serve as a training ship until early 1936, when she was transferred to the um, fishery production duty. Later that year, she joined the non-intervention patrols off Spain during the Spanish Civil War. After the German heavy cruiser Dutchland, also known as the Lotso, was attacked by Republican bombers in the so-called Dutchland Incident. Cohen transported wounded crew members from the Dutchland back to Germany. Cohen conducted a further uh, four patrols off Spain before returning to the fishery production in the North Sea in 1938. Late in the year, she went to dry dock for a refit in Kiel. In March of 1939, Colin sailed to Memo, now um, in connection with the um, examination of the Mem- Mem- Memoland district, which Germany had demonstrated or demanded be returned by um, Lithuania. Later in the year, she joined the battleship that came as Gneisenau, and the heavy cruisers that came as Dutchland, came as Admiral Scheer, and the KMS Admiral Graf Spee for a major series of maneuvers in the Atlantic. In the final days of August 1939, Cohen was stationed in the Western Baltic to prevent Polish vessels from fleeing after the planned German invasion of Poland on the 1st of September. She was unsuccessful in this task. She thereafter joined her sister ships in laying a series of defensive minefields. Colon um, again joined the Gneisenau and nine destroyers for a sortie into the North Sea on the 7th through the 9th of October. The goal was to draw units of the Royal Navy under a U-boat line and into range of the Luftwaffe, though it failed on both accounts. The British launched an aircraft consisting of 12 Wilmington bombers, though it too failed to hit any of the German warships. On the, um, on the 20th through the 22nd of November, Colin and the cruiser um, Leipzig escorted the battleship St. Gneisenau and the battleship Scharnhorst on the first leg of their sortie into the North Atlantic. On the 22nd, Colin and Lipritz were detached to join an unsuccessful patrol for Allied merchant ships in the um, Schurkirk, along with Dutchland and three torpedo boats. The patrol lasted until the 25th of November and failed to locate any Allied um, freighters. On the 13th of December, Colin, Leipzig, and the KMS Nuremberg covered the return of several destroyers that had awaited an offensive minefield off Newcastle. Colin took part in Operation Wentzburg, the inv- or the invasion of Norway, in April of 1940. She was assigned to Group 3, tasked with the assault on Bergen, along with her sister Konigsberg. She reached the harbor unscathed, but Konigsberg was not so lucky. She was badly damaged by Norwegian coastal guns. Colin nevertheless supported the German infantry ashore with her main guns. After the port was secured, she returned to Germany, along with a pair of destroyers, in late 1940. 
she went into Dreadnought for further modifications. A distinguishing a distinguishing coil was installed along with a helicopter landing platform on top of turret um, Bruno. She thereafter served as a test bed for the Flintness FI two eight two helicopter, a task she performed until nineteen forty two. While still conducting experiments with the FI two eight two in September nineteen forty one, Kone or Colin provided gunfire support to ground troops attacking Soviet positions on Dango in the Gulf of Riga. She also bombarded Soviet positions in um, Rishtina. She joined the battleship KMS Tirpitz, the heavy cruiser Ad Admiral Scheer, and the light cruiser Nuremberg, and several destroyers with tor and torpedoes formed the Baltic Fleet, which was intended to block any Soviet warships from fleeing the eastern Baltic. No Soviet vessels attempted to do so. However, on the 13th of July, the Soviet submarine switched a 3 2 2 try to attack at Colin, but the cruiser's escort forced the Soviet submarine to break off the attack. Toward the end of 1941, she was transferred to the North Sea and went into Dreadhawk for her last major modification. This consisted of the installation of a FUMO 21 radar set on the forward command center roof. In July of 1942, Colin departed Germany to join the growing naval presence in Norway, though she saw no major action there. On the 13th of September, she and the heavy cruisers the KMS Admiral Scheer and the KMS Admiral Hipper and two destroyers attempted to attack convoy PQ-18 while en route from Narvik to Alta Ford. The Fortilla was attacked by the British submarine HMS Tigris, but the torpedoes passed behind the German warships. The convoy was instead attacked by U-boats and long-range bombers, which sank at 13 freighters. She returned to Germany in January of 1943, where she was decommissioned in Kiel on the 17th of February. She was sent to Dreadhawk in early 1944 for an overhaul to prepare her to return to combat duty. This was completed by the 1st of July. The cruiser se um, severed briefly as a training ship before escorting German merchant vessels in Norway. Well en route from um, Kruisensund on the 7th of July, the ship laid a defensive minefield on the Sturkirk. She and three destroyers laid another minefield on the fifteenth, on the fourteenth, th through the fifteenth of July, before steaming to Trumpelheim. On the night of the thirteenth and fourteenth of December, Cohn was attacked by British bombers in Oxford. Several near misses caused damage to her propulsion system that required repair. That required repair repair in Germany. She was de she departed Norway on the 23rd of January, 1945, in company with the Admiral Hipper and a destroyer, and arrived in Kiel on the 8th of February. She then proceeded to Wilmenshaven, where she was again attacked by Allied bombers um, repeatedly, or repeatedly, or repeatedly, duly. On the 30th of March, B-24 Liberators from the 8th Air Force attacked the harbor. Cohen was hit and sank on an, on an even keel. Since her guns remained above water, the ship was used as an artillery battery to defend the city from advancing Allied forces. 
She served in this capacity until the end of the war in May. She was um, personally uh, dismantled in situ after the end of the war and finally raised in 1956 for scrapping. And with that, it concludes today's video. If you guys did enjoy, please do go hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. And make sure you guys ring that notification bell so that you guys do not miss out on any future content. Um, if you guys did enjoy what you guys saw today, please go watch some more content of mine. And with that being said, I thank everybody for tuning in. And I shall see you guys all on the high seas. Peace out.